705-706. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started um, with this program tonight. So um, those who are coming in, we welcome you here tonight. Um, this is a time where we're going to um, get to know Sterling a little bit more in the journey he's been taking for the last few years. And um, if you're watching, uh, we welcome you to this program too as well. So um, just in case, um, to give us a little intro on what um, has been going on with Sterling for the last few years, we'll check out this video and then um, we'll come right back and uh, get to know Sterling a little bit more and what's been going on in his life. So um, let's check out this video real quick and then we'll come right back. told Sterl, I say he was running so fast in one of them races that um, I thought he was running by himself. Um, so just a tremendous job. And um, yeah, so let's give it up for Sterling just from what we saw there. Hey, so listen, uh, we of course, we wanted to um, create an opportunity for Sterling to tell a little bit of his story and just a little bit of what's been going on in his life. Because um, when was it you moved out to California? What year was that? in 2004. 2004. 2004, in the summer of 2004. So it's been 13 years since he's been um, around here. Now, he, he still looks the same. I mean, he still looks like Sterling, so n nothing much has changed there. So he's still like the 18-year-old that left here 13 years ago. Um, but a lot has happened in his life, and um, we want to give him the opportunity to kind of share that um, on this platform tonight and um, also give you guys an opportunity if y'all got any questions that y'all like to ask him 
Um, and then also we have opportunity, um, some other folk going to share some stuff. So uh, we'll get right into it. I got some questions that I'm going to ask him and um, kind of just um, let him just flow with some of these answers. So, all right, so first of all, you know, I was sharing with you in the office that, you know, I think most of us, we just looked up one day and started you started seeing you run track. And a lot of us were like, wait a minute, Sterling runs track? When did that start happening? Uh, because we all, most of us, we knew that you was going out to California to play football. And then all of a sudden, you ended up in track. So tell us a little bit, how, how did you get motivated to get into the track world? Um, actually, my coach from Go to West College came and he recruited me over um, for track and field. He saw me running on the football field and he invited me to come out. Um, I decided to go out and um, it was kind of unusual because I never really took track serious. I was more of a mainly a football and basketball player. And um, I um, just started running. And um, I started being motivated when, honestly, when I started breaking like school records. Um, I didn't really try to break the school records. Uh, that wasn't really my, you know, that's something I wanted to do. But it just came like very like um, natural to me. And I started being motivated by doing that, by running track and field. Yeah, what, what, what that's cool. So you said the coach came out and saw you while you was playing football. And I, I know you told me the story, too, as well, is that when you went out there running, you didn't even have track shoes. No. Um, actually, I broke the school record in my jump shoes. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember the jump shoes that was in the storage, and I just grabbed them. And at the time, I needed it was track shoes was like fifty, sixty dollars, and it was my first year in college, and I was like fifty, sixty dollars. I kind of need that for food. Yeah, and that's so that's a lot of money to a college of, student. Um, instead of using that money for track shoes, I went and bought a pack of noodles and <laughs> peanut butter <laughs> Ain't jelly that like sandwiches. Ain't like the romaine noodles, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, but that's cool. So, um, tell us a little bit, man. We saw in the video, in the intro video, a little bit of your training. Tell us a little bit, what is your training um, schedule like? What, what, what is your typical training schedule? Every day I get up at 5 o'clock. I eat um, at 6 o'clock. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What time you get up? 5 o'clock in the morning. All right. Well, it takes me like an hour to get out of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> so I think most of us got that testimony. So the whole hour I'm sitting there thinking, you know, about me getting motivated to get up. Right. And I get up in the morning at 5 I eat at 5.30, um, I leave my place at 6, I get to the track at 7 o'clock, um, I train, I warm up, I train to like 9 o'clock, and from 9 o'clock I take a break, I eat, drink a protein shake, after that I get in the gym at 11 o'clock to about 12, 12.30, and that was consistently every day that I did that, and if I had a little bit more energy in the afternoon, I would go five or six o'clock as well, I go out and do some training in the grass, run some hills, do stadiums as well. Mm. Wow, wow, wow. So uh, you, you, you said you go and eat, so, so tell us a little bit, what is your, um, tell us a little bit about your nutrition regimen. How, what did you eat? Because of course, being, a, being someone that's trying to run in the Olympics, you can't do like what we do is go to McDonald's and Burger King and Hardee's. Um, <laughs> Your, your nutrition regimen has to be a little bit different. So what is your typical nutrition regimen for you? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead and discourage us and make us feel real bad. I have oatmeal. I have raisins, nuts. I eat a lot of vegetables. I eat a lot of salads. I eat a lot of grilled chicken, sandwiches. Um, I don't eat any fried food. I don't eat any sweets, no ice cream. No cereal, no milk. Wait a minute, man. You discouraging <laughs> everybody that's in this room, bruh. You messing us all up. No ice cream, no fried chicken. No soul food, no McDonald's, no Burger King. No Wait Popeyes. a minute. His girlfriend Carmen is here. We need to make sure. We need to check on that, and we need to make sure that that's correct. Does he eat a fried food? Is that correct? No fried food. Not when he's training. Wow, wow. No Hungry Howie's Pizza, no Blaze Pizza. Wait a minute, you in California, wait a minute. Um, was it no In-N-Out? No, no, Ross 
Roscoe's chicken. No Roscoe's chicken and waffles. Oh, man. No lie to you. I had Roscoe's chicken and waffles one time as I was training. I felt so bad I was sick for two days because I ate out of my regimen. Wow. Yeah, I was so sick, and I felt so bad that I had a tooth drawn on the day that I wasn't supposed to have a tooth drawn. Wow. So that's how I met. I knew that my body was so accustomed to what I needed to be doing to get to where I needed to get to. But, yeah, it was. I drank a lot of water. I had no Gatorade, no Powerade. Sodas, no Kool Aid, <laughs> no popcorn, no. Um, I had chips, but I had some chips. You just suffering, man. Yeah. So if my pastor ever tell me I need to have a fasting, I I think I would have been okay. Yeah, that would have been that. easy for you. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. They, if the pastor said, "Hey, we need to fast," that's just easy for you. You kind of need to do it the other way right. instead of fast and just eat. <laughs> you know, make it a little harder for you. But, but um. Wow, that, that's 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 tremendous. So, um, um, so tell us a little bit. Um, you, of course, one of the great things that I'm proud of you about, and one of the great things about social media is you were able to see what's going on in people's lives, even thousands of miles away. Is that we we saw that you just finished your college degree. Yes, sir. Yes. He got his college degree, <laughs> which is tremendous. Um, so tell us a little bit about what your degree is in and what your plans are. Um, on what you plan on doing with your degree. Oh, okay. But um, I want to thank my girlfriend, Carmen. Um, the reason why I want to thank her is because um, she made me realize, um, she just made me, she just gave me a better perspective about life. Um, you know, you always run into people that help you out and you have to pay attention to those type of people. Because there's a lot of people that come into your life and you think they're trying to hinder you. And which there are some, but there's also some that's trying to help you progress. And um, I like to thank her for that because um, I either, you know, worked a job that I didn't want to work, but I had to do that to <laughs> try to make ends meet. But um, she made me realize that I was still young and um, still young at heart, but when I tell kids my age, they make me feel even older. And um, <laughs> she made me realize that why not just go back and finish what I started. And um, because of that mentality, I was able to get two degrees, not only finish one, but I was able to finish two, so I have a Wow, degree. wow, that's good. And, um, that's good. I got a degree in Bachelor's of Science um, with Administration of Sports Synthesis. Um. <laughs> so what, what are your plans on um, doing with your degree? What are your plans on um, in the future with that? Um, I want to be a head coach um, okay. one day. I want to. What sport you, you you like to coach? I like to either track and field or football. Okay. I want to be at the highest level I can. Right. What I'm about to take to break the group down. I know my degree is like the is a business administration, and you know I hate to say it, but sports is becoming a business now. Right. And um, I want to manage kids not for money, but manage kids to help them achieve their goals. Um, because sometimes a lot of coaches get, and you know, a lot of coaches, a lot of parents get caught up in trying to make money out of their kids the wrong way instead of the right way. I want to, I want to help kids in the area, start a business, and um, a business with kids trying to get scholarships. Okay. So that's what I'm trying to do in the near term. It's good. Start my business. It's a good goal, good vision, good job, good job, good job. Great, man. So, of course, you know, you, um, you went to the Olympic trials. Um, it was in Oregon, right? Yes, sir. Out in Eugene, Oregon, and... I think our whole city was jumping up and down, watching that and going crazy and, and seeing you run. And uh, my kids was jumping and watching. They didn't even know who you were. They was like, who is Sterling? You know, <laughs> I mean, like, who are, you know, because all of my kids was born after you left. So, um, you know, we was educating them on who you were. And um, it's like I said in church yesterday is that I would tell me he's our real cousin because, you know, when, when people get on TV, they start saying, hey, that's my cousin. They ain't even no kin to those people. You know, you ask them, well, how is that your cousin? What They like my play play cousin, you know. But um, so you went to Olympic trials. Uh, what was that experience like? What did you learn the most at that experience? Because that is one of the biggest televised, if not the most televised, track and field event here in America. What did you learn the most from that event? And tell us a little bit about that experience. Um, what I learned the most, and I didn't really learn it until I was beside the 
fastest guys not only in the USA but in the world. Mm. And um, as I walked out, it was over twenty two thousand people. And I was like, man, this this is big, you know, a concert, twenty two thousand people, millions of people seeing this. And that's when I knew that all the all the hard work I put into this, all the me not giving up, um, all the just um, just a lot of just positive things, a lot of positive people that I kept around me, um, it all paid off. You know, um, there was hurdles in my road, but I, I, I never gave up. I jumped over those hurdles, and I kept God first. Yeah. And, um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about those hurdles. I know you was telling me a little bit about some stuff in the office. Tell us a little bit about some of the stuff you went through to get to that point of where you were. Um, I had two car accidents. Um, I went from place to place. Just like it, it was so difficult for me to where I even I questioned myself, what am I doing here? Mm-hmm. Um, I went from place to place, um, jobs after jobs, trying to make it, taking the bus to work, taking the bus to school, walking like two two miles to school, you know, with some boots. Um, that's the only boots that I had, and um, I I just knew that I knew I had a lot a lot of left inside of me. Because you're saying, too, you, you ended up in Oklahoma for a little bit. Yes, I ended up in Oklahoma. And um, I complain a lot about my life. Um, I, I My first year in college was very well, very successful. Um, I broke multiple records. Um, I accomplished a lot of things that the school has never seen just for somebody just to walk out and do good things like that. And um, I was up here. And then once I got in a car accident, it just went here, then went here, then went there. It took me to go to Oklahoma to see that I was never in a bad situation, that, yeah, I had a hurdle in front of me, but those hurdles were something that if you put trust in God and trust in yourself, that you can get over those hurdles. Right, right, um, right. Amen. It took me, it, it, it took me to go to Oklahoma to see that, and um, once I got to Oklahoma, I was working a job in California, you know, making $12 an hour, and I thought, uh, you know, this is, you know, 12 hour, 13 hour shifts, and I felt like it was just, you know, too much for me. But I went to Oklahoma and I was working at a warehouse making seven, eight dollars an hour. And that's when I realized, like, you know, you know, I should never been complaining in the first place. And once I realized that, that's when I decided to make a change in myself and change in my life. And by doing that, um, I had to put God, bring Him back into my life because sure. a lot of people said that, you know, you need to go out and God this and that. And there's a lot of things now these days that people say the Bible is a myth. And, you know, now these days we can't even pray with our teammates and we can't pray amongst ourselves because people just kind of want to just push God away. And I'm not going to put any religion on anyone, but I'm going to just tell everyone how God was very effective in my life. And once I found him. That's right. That's right. Uh, t- tell us a bit on um, car wrecks. You say you was in a couple of car wrecks. How did that affect your life and, and just what happened with that whole situation? Uh, um, I got into my first car wreck in 2006, and um, it, it affected me a, a whole lot, made me very depressed. Um, it wasn't like I was hurt for – I was hurt for a long time, but the reason why I was depressed because I had everything that I wanted. A lot of you probably remember in high school that I was hurt so much and me dropping passes because of my eyes. And I finally got to a stage in my life to where I could actually felt like, oh, okay, I actually can do something with myself now. And I got in a car accident and everything got taken away. And um, I was very, very then depressed about that to where five, four or five years I didn't watch any sports because I was so distraught about, like, you know, I felt like I had everything in my hand and it just slipped away. 2000 and I would say 13, I came back to California and I got in another car accident. And I was like, this is kind of, you know, what am I doing now? But I remember the hurdles that God took me over to get me to where I'm at. And I was not going to let the second car wreck deter me from where I wanted to go. And um, That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, at what point did you realize, you know what, I can actually um, make the Olympics, you know, because, you know, sometimes we can think things to ourselves because sometimes I wake up in the morning, I'd be like, you know, I can, I can actually play for the Jacksonville Jaguars. 
<laughs> you know, sometimes I'm, I'm like that. You know, I tell myself those things, but then, but then I, I get outside and I try to run and it doesn't work out. Like, you know, my body tells me, go sit your behind down and just go preach, you know. So, um, but as for you, um, at what point did you, you say, you know, I can possibly make the Olympics? Because I remember, uh, like I said, I remember seeing the first video of you running and I'll be honest with you, I was like, is he running against a whole bunch of blind old men? Because he just, he just beating everybody like crazy. And then I remember Rufus going to see you in Jacksonville. And I remember seeing um, Rufus that Sunday after church. I said, Rufus, man, tell me a little bit about Sterling. What, what did he look like? He said, man, he's the real deal. He's legit. He's, he's beating people and beating them so bad. It's almost like the people he's beating shouldn't even got in the race. You know, like they should have stayed at the house. And so, but for you, at what point did you actually say to yourself, you know what, the Olympics could possibly be something that's a reality for me. So uh, at what point did you get there? I say when I flew to New York, I flew the, the day before my track meet, and um, I got to the hotel and I didn't even sleep because um, I got there late and the people were letting me in. So by the time they let me in, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and we're three hours ahead of California. Right. So – I went to sleep like for an hour, bounced back up, went to the track meet, and there was Olympians in my heat in the 200 meters um, for different countries. And um, I had just ran the 400, and don't get me wrong, I ran it really bad. I mean, it was so bad, I didn't even want to show the video. Wow. Yeah, I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, it, w it was pretty funny. And I was running all outside the lines, and the people were supposed to be disqualified, but they felt so sorry for me. They just <laughs> let me go. <laughs> I was by the check-in area, and I had, essentially, I had put down a time, and I thought I was going to have a really good time, and um, I was hearing all the talk, and they said, oh, yeah, we're going to give these guys better lane because, you know, they're Olympians, they've been doing Olympics since 2012, and I was like, are you guys serious? So, I flipped the switch, I went out, beat them, and I, I gold medal, I got money from that, and I said, you know what, if I actually put my mind to it, I really honestly think I can make it to the Olympic trials, and if I actually stay healthy, I really honestly think I can make it to the Olympics. And um, I didn't want to seem like I was putting a crazy dream out there to where it's so unattainable, but you want to, what I did and what I showed my athletes too as well, you want to put a dream out there, you also want to put the steps to get into where you're trying to go. A lot of people want to just put crazy things out there right. and not trying to get to the steps to get there. You, right. you know, let's be realistic. And let's take these steps, and then once we get to that step, let's take the next step, and then we just keep going and going and going. And that's what I did the next following year. I got there and took track meets, and I was running the fastest time I ever ran to open up. And that's when I was like, well, shoot, if I can stay healthy and run fast at the end, I know I can be there. And um, unfortunately, you know, I it's kind of hard to stay at a high level and run at a high level, and it, it's just it's very difficult. Especially making the standard time, it's just everything is just pretty much like you have to have a perfect race, right? And right. you can't run fast every time, but if you just time it up at a perfect time, you can you can be anywhere you really want to be at. And I was very fortunate to be there. Right, it's got to pretty much be a perfect twenty seconds for yeah, you. Yeah, because they don't count anything over two point oh. Right. And the year of the Olympic trials year, I all my races was one meter. This year, when I ran, all my races was in the negative one meter. Right. So it was like, you know, one of those years to where you don't know what's going to happen when you run. Right. And like I said, I was very blessed and very, very fortunate to be to even be there in the surrounding lane with all those athletes. And especially I'm like 31, like 32 now. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never, at, in my 30s, I would never think that I was going to run this fast. Right. And it's just kind of just, it's kind of just really bad. The good thing is that, you know, you told you tell us about the depression you went through, the car wrecks you went through. The great thing is that that was not the end of your story, that God still showed us that he still has so much for you to do. And um, thankful to God for that, that yeah. that that wasn't the end of your story. God still has so much for you to do. So so tell us a little bit. Um, of course, this is 2017. So um, 
what's your plans for the future and are, are you are you planning on trying out for um, which would be 2020 yes I, i'm definitely gonna try out for it um, awesome 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 now, what was the 2020 Olympics would be so we'll know where to get the tickets to? Tokyo? So everybody needs to get tickets to Tokyo. That's in Japan, so we need to get tickets to Tokyo. All right, so 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 wonderful. So what what other encouraging words, man, maybe you would like to share with everybody here? Um, because all of us, you know, or, or just about all of us, and we have some, you know, we have some, we're in our own lane, and, and, our lane might not be track and field. Somebody in here might be business. Somebody might be teaching or coaching. Somebody might be, um, you know, something in church. Somebody else might be um, doing something just on their job or in their family. What What are the encouraging words that you would like to share with us today about um, that? First, you want to you want to keep God in your life. Um, it doesn't matter what you do, what people say. You want to just keep God in your life. You know, you, I mean, if you want to, I would say, you know, pull your Bible out here and there if you can. You can search your phone, you know, I would say keep God in your life first. Um, you want to stay positive. Um, I, with the hurdles that I had, um, I stay positive, and I also stay positive with positive people that are surrounding me, and I have a couple of good friends around me that that's very influential in my life. Um, I have one friend, he will always tell me that I can make it if I actually put my mind to it and stay focused, and Unfortunately, he passed away in 2007, and um, he stuck inside of me when I was one of the main reasons why I wanted to get back with running. And I had another guy friend. He was, no matter what, he was always there saying things positive for me. Even when things didn't look great, it was positive. And sure enough, years, years later, everything came out, and he pretty much, like he said, it was it turned out positive. Everything was great. You want to, you want to not give up. There's a lot of things that's going to happen, a lot of obstacles. Um, God will test you, <laughs> and also the devil will try to test you too as well. Mm. And um, like I always was told that um, before God elevates you, he's going to put you in certain situations to see if you're ready for him to elevate you. That's right. And um, when he thinks you're ready, he's going to elevate you when you think you're not ready. And you're already ready because God already took you through those testimonies to get to where you got to get to. Sound like you've been looking at my preaching notes, <laughs> man, about going to another level. Man, wow. Yeah, you, it's all about patience. You have to be very patient to where you try to get to. Sometimes as a runner, as myself, I want to go out and run fast every time, but that's, that's not going to happen. And you have to be very patient to where you're trying to get to. You know, just because... Justin Gatlin is at a 19.6, you know, I can't think that, oh, you know, I want to go and run a 19.6. You know, it takes it, it took him a while to get there. It took patience to get there. I can't just automatically want to go out and run that because that's something I have to be very patient in doing. And um, you want to stay determined. Stay determined about your goals. Um, yeah, I'm 32. There's a lot of people in here that's young. A lot of people are old there's still a lot of goals to attain and a lot of yeah. goals to achieve just because you feel like, like how Pastor Maxwell said yesterday, just because you, you kind of want to keep going. You don't want to stay here. You don't want to stay home. That's you right. want to get out. You still want to try to go and do things with your life. That's right. You know, so those are the th encouraging things that I had to encounter that I want to give to you guys um, to, to stay forward, keep going. Um, there's always greater things on the other side of the mountain. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, just don't give up. Just stay, stay focused. It's good stuff, man. Good stuff. You know, and I, w I want to say to you, Sterling, you know, we're very proud of you here in Union County. I mean, tremendously proud of you, um, your family. Um, we are godly proud of all that you're doing. And I want to say to you as well, know that you have more supporters than you have haters. Oh, yeah. You have more people on your side, man. And um, we're going to root you on. And um, no matter, you know, if it's in the Olympics, uh, whether it's coaching, um, if it's helping kids out, um, we want to continue to root you on and continue to, um, you know, applaud every step that you take because we think it's tremendous, man, especially 
um, to be able to continue to do what you're doing, um, to be able to be positive after all the stuff you've gone through. We're very, very proud of you. So uh, let's give it up again for Sterling, everybody. Listen, I want Coach Hoare to come and share some stuff. Um, he's going to share some encouraging words with us, too, as well. He coached um, Sterling. Let's give it up for Coach Hoare, everybody. I actually feel guilty uh, because he talked about diet to start with, about not eating fried food, not eating ice cream. Well, in the last three days, I ate bit of Jerry's, Haagen-Dazs. <laughs> Fried chicken, fried shrimp, everything within three days. So I felt really bad. But one of the things as I sat here and I was reflecting on things that Sterling had talked about, you know, when he was just a youngster, I remember watching him in middle school, and he would always come up to Coach Cummings, myself, Coach Nobles, the other Coach Pruitt. We would always talk and mess with him, and he was just a little young guy then. And uh, even when – we went our separate ways as coaches, and some went to Georgia, and some went over to Bradford, and we actually played back then. Uh, you know, we would talk to Sterling. Sterling would talk to us, and over the years, Sterling and I, we had kind of a unusual kind of a relationship. I'd hear from him, then I wouldn't hear from him. He'd hear from me, then he wouldn't hear from me. Then all of a sudden, you know, I'd talk to one of his relatives, and they would tell me things. And I also felt a little guilty, but I understand now listening to him. Over the years, you know, we have athletes and students go a lot of different places, and they ask for help when they need it a lot of times. And I felt guilty, Sterling, I'm just going to tell you, not helping you. But then I said, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the things with Sterling, he's a proud person. He's quiet. He's humble. I guarantee you he didn't let mom and dad know. He didn't let a bunch of people know because he didn't want to put a burden on them. He took it all on himself. But really that was God putting it all on you because you could put it all back on him. And, you know, we, we've had some unusual different conversations over the years, and I think about some of the phone calls or when he was in Oklahoma, when he was in California, the things we talked about. And then I'm just like everybody else. We always knew he was fast. And then all of a sudden, one day, it's like, oh, my gosh, he's an Olympic-style fast. And it was, it was amazing. And, you know, as I sat there, it reminded me as a coach that, you know, these young kids as they're growing up and they come up and tell you, I want to, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to play in the NBA. I want to play in the NFL. And sometimes they're this tall. And, you know, you can't shoot those kids' dreams down because there's an old saying, there, there may be giants among us. You never know what these children are going to grow into. You can't discourage them. His dreams were achieved as a young man, not as a teenager, not as a 20-year-old. And I look at that and I listen to that, and I'm like, he never gave up on his dreams. And a lot of times I tell our students, and even sometimes as I'm talking to adults, they're always talking about, I don't know if I want to leave here, you know, this job here or this school. And I, I just tell them, you know, I love Union County like everybody else, but, you know, there's areas that we're not as good as we need to be, and there's some that we're probably better than we should be. But I always tell people, you know, don't be afraid to go to grow. And as he's gone, <coughs> you've got to excuse me, my voice is kind of gone, but, you know, I think of all the things he's accomplished, guys, and, you know, he chased his dreams. And uh, God had his hand in it, and, you know, he was patient because he is 32 years old. He didn't give up. And you look at him now, and you see this articulate, confident young man who has a beautiful fiancé sitting over there. Am I right? Fiancé. <laughs> Just making sure I didn't want to rush things. You know, maybe we might see that moment tonight. I don't know. But, but. You know, we are so proud of you, and uh, I'm humbled to be here. And, uh, you know, you actually opened my eyes to some other things that are private among me and you over the years. And, uh, man, I am so blessed. And, uh, you know, people say, as coaches, they tell us, well, you know, you impacted this young man or this young lady. What they miss is a lot of these young kids as they're growing up, guys, they impact us. They impact us. You know, and they impact us when they get arrested. They impact us when they graduate from college. 
They impact us when we go to their funerals. I mean, so many things over the years, and man, we are so proud of you, and you have impacted me and some things that I'll share with you later in private, okay? I love you, man. Thank you, Coach. And thank you for having me here. Thank you. All right, um, real quick, does anybody have any questions? Maybe you want to ask Sterling tonight um, before we dismiss and give you opportunity maybe to ask anything. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. How do you run and not get cramps? <laughs> she says she just walk and get cramps. So, so what do you do about cramps? Take care of my diet. Diet, drink a lot of water. all comes about the diet not good school just buy good <laughs> when last time you had a piece of fried chicken uh, before I came here that was like two years ago we need to go up there to kangaroo before we leave that before you leave we but need the to go chicken there. here was like dripping so much grease to where I felt it ain't good it. unless it's dripping I know. <laughs> no we good well, um okay um let's see you got another question then we'll go What your mile power? You been clocked at? Um, I did it. I would say I did it one time. It was like 20 miles per hour. If I had that. 20 time. miles per hour. Yeah. That's probably about what I figured. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, Deacon George, what you got? <laughs> What's your favorite cheat meal? Your favorite cheat meal? Uh, I think it's chicken and waffles. <laughs> Chicken and waffles. Is 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 Roscoe's? Yeah. Okay. But I feel guilty every time I eat it though. Feel bad. It makes me want to go back and eat some more. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Pat, what you got? What's your fastest run? What's your fastest time? I ran a twenty point three, uh twenty point four in the two hundred, ran a ten three in the hundred, ran a forty six twenty seven in the four hundred. Pretty I think fast. I could have ran faster, but, you know, because I coach and I teach school as well, so it's kind of hard for me to focus on just strictly just running. Right. But, right. Um, yeah, I think I could go a whole lot faster. But I'm, I'm going to try to see before I get, get too old and be at a what-if mode. What if I'd have done this? What if I'd have done that? Right, 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 right. And that's good. I like that, that you don't want to live a life of what-ifs. It's better to live a life of old whales than what-ifs. So you could at least say, hey, oh, well, I tried. Yeah, that's one of the main reasons why I started back running. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I would go to sleep, wake up, and I would say, what if I would have done this? What if I would have done that? Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't want to leave any more question marks. That's right. And um, I think just from what I've done, I, I'm not content because I still want to go higher. But if I am not able to run at a high level anymore, I am happy that I did go back to pursue and not have that what-if mode again. Okay, good, good, good. Anybody else got any questions? Uh, yes, Sis Lonnie. That's a good question. Like, like, uh, how do you make sure you don't, you know, false start? What, what, how you prepare for to make sure you don't false start with the gun? Because I'm sure y'all, y'all adrenaline is, is, it's got to be flowing so much. So what do you do to make sure you don't false start? It's a lot of repetition, a lot of focus. It's, I, I false start maybe once a couple of times, and I never thought that was the thing. Mm -hmm. Coach yelled at me, I never did it again. Yeah. But I just say like a lot of repetition and just focus. Yeah. So you, like, how often when you're training, how often you practice coming out of the blocks? Thirty, forty times. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's like I don't know. That's like a bad feeling to false start. I can't keep training. I don't need. Because the new rule is just one yeah, false start, you out. Yeah. It's not like how it was back in the '80s where you got two false starts, yeah. but now it's one and you're gone. Yeah, one false start and you're gone. Yeah. I think it happened to me. I think last year or the year before, false mm -hmm. started. Oh man, I, I 
like, thank God. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then, then I didn't run again until the next trial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. Well, any other questions? Um, princess? What place are you going to run next? What's going to be the lo location when you run next? Um, it's going to be next year. I was thinking about going to, um, it's called the Armory. It's in New York. It's like a really good track meet in uh, New York on the East Coast. It's an indoor meet. Mm -hmm. it's tele it'll be televised on NBC. Um, so I think that's probably going to be next year for me, going to the Armory. It's probably there. So he'll run in New York next time. So you're taking a little time off yeah. until then. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Coach Ord. <laughs> and I dropped him a pur uh, purposely away so he wouldn't make, put me in there again. <laughs> <laughs> he was purposely messing up so he would yeah, not be doing it. Don't hear about that. Yeah, he's <laughs> going to watch this, though. Uh, that's the bad part. <laughs> and the same thing happened in college. They tried to make me do hurdles. I was like, man, the hurdles are so high. So I was like, man, I was kind of a little tentative and scared of falling and getting all scratched up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, oh, back there to Miss Julia. Okay. How many times you train a week, and um, how long is each of your sessions? I go Monday through Saturday, a total of four hours. Mm. Yeah. And um, when I don't train, I'm on YouTube watching my videos, trying to perfect my craft, um, seeing who's the next upcoming runner. You know, I'm trying to – whoever's in my heat, I already done scouted them out, see where their weaknesses at. Yeah. I kind of get that from – you know, watching film with Coach Hord and Coach Pruitt back in the days, and when you translate to college, I'm always watching something about craft, trying to trying to get better. So I would say Monday through Saturday is four hours, and then Sunday, I come home from church, and I'm always like oh, watching video or something or practice drill or trying to see what's out there. Gotcha, Miss Shirley. How many records you done broke? Since I started back runner, I have 12, I would say 13 records in my name. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Uh, that's all a couple of, yes, ma'am. <laughs> the whole track. One time around, how long that take? I'll say like 46 seconds. But I'd be tired afterwards. So You'd be getting tired. Yeah. Gotcha. Sometimes the paramedics have to come and get me out. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Y yes, Janice. How long you plan on running before you retire? Probably until I'm 40 years old. That's good. That's good. That's good. And if I have a kid and look before then, uh, you know, I'll probably evaluate it then. Right. But past, like, three or four years, I haven't really been doing that many track meets. I haven't really had a lot of wear and tear on my body. A lot of the other track athletes, they probably run, like, up to, like, 40, 50 times a year. Right. And I don't think I ran, like, maybe, like, eight or nine times. So I still think I have a lot of left inside of me. Gotcha. But it just depends on how healthy I stay and how much I can progress throughout the year. Gotcha. Gotcha. Stay away from Roscoe's waffles <laughs> and chicken. You'll be able to run to 40. <laughs> That's good, that's good. All right, y'all enjoyed the night? You had, a qu you had another question, no leader. Miss Julie, what is too young for kids to start running? Um, I would say they can start out like five to six years old. They can start out. Anything under that is kind of like, five, six, seven years old, they can go out and run. I won't really say go out and get a personal trainer for them because <laughs> I see a lot of parents do that at seven, eight years old. And I, they want to get personal trainer. I'm like, let the kid go out and run. Let him develop. Let him grow on his own. Let him like the sport. Right, right, of, right. Not right. To force it. And they, they hate it by the time right. they're 18. Yeah, because you know. there's a lot of parents, you know, that contact me trying to train their kids, and they're so young. And, you know, I kind of don't want to train them because I'd rather for them just to develop on their own. Instead of me trying to rush them or hurt them, and you know, there's a lot of permanent damage that you can happen to them, especially with kids. So, I would just say those ages in there, 
put him out, just let him run, have fun. It's good. It's good advice. Good advice. Again, y'all enjoyed tonight. Well, listen. Thank y'all for coming out. Um, um, to um, his his parents are here, and Christian and Johnny's up here on the front row, um, all proud. She's recording with her phone. So proud of them, and just um, proud of you again, man. Listen, we want you to know we're gonna support you. Um, hopefully, we'll have to get it. Hopefully, we'll have to get a ticket to Tokyo. Hopefully, we'll have to get a ticket to Tokyo, Japan in 2020, and, um, and we'll, we'll be there just having a good time with Bells and Wilsters on. So, listen, let me pray. Um, if y'all don't mind, if we can stand, I'm, we're going to pray and dismiss. Um, afterwards, uh, we got a little area out there in the lobby. Go out there. Let's take some pictures with Sterling. Y'all put on your social media and everywhere, and um, um, let's let him know how proud we are of him of coming out and um, sharing his testimony with us. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we once again, we thank you for this night. And um, thank you for the life of Sterling. And thank you, God, for his testimony. And thank you, God, for what he has been a blessing to us in, God. Helping us to know that our lives are not over. Our story is not finished. That you have a happy ending, God, to all of our lives. As your word says, God, in Jeremiah 29 and 11, God, that you have great plans for us, God. You have a great ending to our story. And God, I con continue to pray for Sterling as he does his work and does does what he you're called him to do out in California. Put your hand on him mightily, God. Protect him and strengthen him, God, and just bless him in a tremendous way. And God, we forever thank you. Bless everyone who's here tonight, and we'll forever honor you and bless you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you.